Hi, today we're going to talk about a simple coupled oscillators problem. I'm going to do a physical analysis. I'm really just going to set up the math and not really do much of it. Uh, this video is being created for an undergraduate intermediate mechanics course, which we call Physics 310 at my school, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Intermediate mechanics is a pretty standard title across the curriculum in American physics departments. So if you have a course by that title, it should be about the same. Uh, this is meant to be a very first, almost a zeroth example, so I'm not really going to do most of the math. Uh, I'm going to get into that in lecture a lot, but here I'm just going to try to show you how to set up the math and show you how that relates to what's physically going on. Uh, so everything I actually do in this video should be straightforward to follow, even if you're actually in the introductory course before this, which uh, on my campus we call Physics 130. Um, I expect that you should be familiar, completely comfortable uh, with Newton's laws and the harmonic oscillator. If you are indeed in the introductory course at the beginning of the semester, you haven't hit that yet, but you should be able to follow what I do with it. You should be okay with identifying a set of linear equations and changing it into a matrix. That's something that's supposed to be in high school curriculum. I know not everyone gets comfortable there, but it's supposed to be there. Uh, the case I'm going to deal with is two by two, so it ought to look pretty easy. Maybe it's too simple an example. Uh, but at some point in here, I'm going to claim that some things are clear from what I call physical intuition. It's a common phrase. You need to be able to think about real systems, how things actually move, in this case, very simple ones. Uh, so I, I expect that you kind of get that. And uh, if, if that makes you pause when we get there, stop and you know, think about how things move. It's really critical to understanding the physics of what's going on instead of just the math. In this case, well, here's the picture. Um, it's constrained to one dimension, and every once in a while in a class, somebody will ask, how does that happen? I don't care. This is a mathematical model in some sense. All the spring constants are the same. That is, each spring is of the same type. Uh, the masses are the same. Because I wanted to make this the simplest case, uh, the walls, those big barriers at the ends are uh, completely fixed and everything is ideal, the springs are massless, there's no friction, no air resistance, anything like that. Please don't make the problem harder than it is. Uh, so we want to set up to do some analysis. I've already drawn the coordinates I'm going to use there. Uh, X coordinate seems obvious and I have two things, so even though it's 1D, I need two coordinates, one for the first mass, one for the second mass. Uh, on the left mass, the one with the coordinate x1, only the springs attached to it actually exert forces on it. Of course, what the other spring is doing matters in some sense, but it doesn't directly exert a force on it. Same is true for the other mass, only the springs attached to it actually exert a force on it. So we want to use Newton's laws and write that mathematically, make some equations. Uh, the big law that we always use for writing an equation is that the sum of forces is mass times acceleration, and on each object there's two forces and an acceleration. And I've used the notation here of the double dot for the second time derivative. So on the left mass, the coordinate is x1, and I've got a negative kx from the spring on the left of it, and negative kx, well x isn't x1, it's the difference in spring in positions that gives me the spring extension, and you have to be careful too because when this spring pulls, it brings you to positive x1, and when it pushes, it brings you to negative x1. Frankly, getting the signs right in this kind of problem can be a bit of a mess. So you really have to be careful and go back and look and think, 
when I move each thing or when each coordinate displaces what actually happens to the mass involved. And I can write the equation for the other mass. Uh, I have f equals negative kx for its own coordinate. And the spring on the right, and for the spring that they share, I have an f equals negative kx for the difference in coordinates, but it's pointed in the opposite direction. So again, it, this is in some sense the hard part. Get those signs right. And they are right here, I guarantee it for you. So now we've got a couple of equations and we want to find out what goes on. Now, the fact that the spring constants are the same is going to allow us to factor out the k's in those expressions. Of course, if they weren't the same, this would be a more difficult problem. It would still be solvable. Same is true for the masses. Uh, they're the same. That's going to make things easier as we go on. At this step, and when I factor things out in each equation, it doesn't make any difference. But when I put the equations together, it does make a difference. We're going to assume sinusoidal oscillations. So I go back and forth. Uh, as a function of time that is sine of x or cosine, I don't care. Uh, in a sense, that's an assumption, and the, that assumption uh, is going to be proven because we're going to stick something in and see that we get an answer that works, and there's a uniqueness there, and it says if that's an answer, it's the answer. It also, by the way, does depend at some level with springs or related systems and the fact that those are small oscillations. But Hooke's law already assumed that, so that's what we're looking at. Uh, we're going to be looking for the normal modes, the way that these things vibrate in regular patterns. That means that there's only an overall frequency to solve for, not separate frequencies for the two things. Now, there's two objects. There should be two normal modes. You may not know that yet. We're going to show that. Uh, but that's what we're looking for, and that's what we can solve for. So we got to take that algebra and clean it up a bit, shuffle those things around. The assumption of sinusoidal motion turns all the calculus here into algebra, because the second derivative of a sine function is a sine function. You get the arguments multiplier, that omega, comes out twice, once for each derivative, and you get an overall minus sign. But since I have still a sine, an S-I-N-E function with a minus S-I-G-N, second derivative is proportional to the original function. When I use that and I group terms, my equation for the left mass has x1, x2, and x1. x1. My equation for the right mass has the same variables. There are no derivatives anymore. That's pretty convenient, isn't it? I pulled the k over to the right side in each equation, and I lined these variables up. To make you notice, this is a linear system of equations in x1 and x2. I don't know what omega is. I have to find it. But when I have a linear system, I can rewrite that as a matrix equation. There are two equations and two unknowns, so it's a two by two matrix. That means when I look at an equation like this, I expect two different possible vectors, x1, x2, which might fulfill this equation. Now, this is a very standard kind of equation for this type of problem and for many other types of problems. We want to look at this for a little while, think about what goes on. That type of problem is called an eigenvalue problem. And if you're taking intermediate mechanics, there's a good chance you're taking quantum mechanics at the same time. They have eigenvalue problems all over the place, too. It is the same type of algebra, even though it may look rather different. So what I want is some vector, x1, x2, which when I multiply by this matrix, I get a scalar multiple of the same vector. We could spend days talking about eigenvalue problems in general. 
Uh, we will spend a lot of time in class, but I'm here to give you a 10 or 15 minute lecture on it. For now, we're going to concentrate on what the variables mean physically and what we're looking for. So again, there are two variables, x1, x2, where those masses go, and we're looking for normal modes. And they move in a reproducible standard pattern. There is a mathematical algorithm for this. There's a way to solve that equation and find out what x1, x2 are and find out what the values of omega are. We're not going to do that. When you do that, you're helped by uniqueness theorems and orthogonality. I'm just going to look at the physical system and say, I know what I think should happen. Uh, in fact, I could use other mathematical statements about symmetry here and translate those. But really, look at it. I know, and I think you know, what a good guess at what might happen. I think if I move the two masses together, so the middle string doesn't compress or extend, that should be a stable pattern. Each one does it does its thing, going back and forth. I also think if the two masses move oppositely, that they crunch that center spring and, and it never moves, but it extends and crunches, that should be a stable pattern. I can try this. I have to translate it into math first. So I claim that the first normal mode, the first thing I talked about, is the two things moving together. The two coordinates are the same. So it's a scalar multiple of the vector 1, 1 in this language. The other thing, moving oppositely, is any scalar multiple of the vector 1 minus 1. Put them in. See if they work. They do. If you look at that matrix equation down there, I have 1 and 1 for x1 and x2. On the top row, I get 2 minus 1 times and 2 minus 1 gives me x1, and here I have minus 1 plus 2. And then, uh, okay, that's going to give me the same thing. Stick them in. What you find out is you get a value of m omega squared over k equals 1 for the first vector. That is, omega squared is k over m. And for the other one, three times as big for omega squared. You find the frequency from having the vectors, the motions. That's part of the output you get. So those state vectors are orthogonal to each other. It can be proven that that's always true, and it might help solve complex systems. We'll talk about that in class. Uh, in fact, you might also notice the more complex-looking one, the one where they go opposite to each other, has a higher frequency. That's also generic. It's a little harder to prove, but it's true. Uh, doesn't help you as much in finding solutions, but it might help you recognize if you find mistakes. Uh, the choice for normalization here is not what we use in linear algebra. These are not unit vectors. Uh, it's a choice. This is what people do. We tend to pick vectors where we have integers, so we can see what's going on. That's really what I wanted to talk about with this very introductory example. In class, we'll talk about some more things. I'll go through this example in more detail. I'll show you the mathematical way to approach that matrix equation. Uh, we'll go on. We'll make the springs different or the masses different. You might add more pieces. You might talk about different types of systems. In particular, in our class, uh, I tend to look at some pendulum problems where I have the two masses hung on a, a real string that's nearly massless and, and see what the normal modes are for that or three. And I'll show you that in class and we'll talk about it. In fact, I also like to do a different kind of pendulum experiment uh, and time things where I tie two pendulums with light string and some washers to the string above, and it's hard to find out what the coupling is, but we can do an experiment and see what goes on. So we can take this a lot further and get a lot more information, but I wanted to broach the topic with you first and show you what's going on, show you what the inputs and outputs are. So if you're in my class, see you in class. If you're not in my class, thanks for watching. Enjoy. Good luck in your own class.